making external calls inside your Solidity contract. So if you've done all the things and you've kind of broken down your contract into a bunch of little different functions and all the other things, and you've put them into different contracts, this is what you're going to do. You're going to be doing an external call. Now, whether that's an external call to your contract or an external call to someone else's contract, this is one of the interesting things to watch because you're going to do this a lot, right? And you're going to make calls to uncusted contracts. These are people you don't know. You just know that they have a function that you really use or need or something else. And sometimes other people just maybe aren't the most security conscious or just wanting to get something out in a hurry. So you can run into some really interesting risks and you can really run into some very interesting errors that can compromise your contract, compromise your liquidity pool, uh, just basically um, mess your day up, right? And again, that's why external calls can sometimes execute malicious code in any contract that is associated with it or dependent upon it. Again, you don't know what's in there or how it actually functions. So when you go through and you do a flow check to see how your contract actually works, even when you're doing an external call, there are ways to make sure that you're doing this securely so that you don't induce unknown or additional issues that are not planned for, right? Such as data compromise, breaking, losing your liquidity pool, exposing your keys, or some other horrible thing that you don't want to have happen. Now, when you're doing your code and you're writing your code, you really want to mark untrusted interfaces. And again, whatever language you use is however you want to do it, but you want to make sure that whoever's reading the code, whoever is going through your QA process knows what is a trusted external call and what is not. Now, the recommendation, of course, inside of all the documentation is just say untrusted contract. Now, the interesting part, though, is you can call it untrusted something or you can use an acronym like like no trust, um, something else. Just whatever you want to make sure there's good marking for a function so that we know that it's untrusted. So we know we're using someone else's code or we're using our code. And again, that's just kind of a convention, right? So. In the examples that they give you online and other places, they just say function make untrusted withdrawal. Now, I know all of a sudden we're going to be making a withdrawal from an untrusted contract and we're going to be using an untrusted bank or something we're not really aware of. Now, the interesting part, though, is if you go back and you're taking a look at wallets or anything else, you can actually go in and check the reputation of the wallet, see if the wallet has been blacklisted at any other point. And that's something you can actually do as its own function and then pass that along as you go through your contract. But the idea is marking it so that it's untrusted. And that's just generally one of those things that you want to make sure that you cover so that the people who are reading your code know where you're working. The other one I thought was really interesting is they're talking about state changes, right? You should assume that malicious code might execute when you use a raw call, such as some address dot call or contract calls or something else as an external contract and a method. Now, regardless of whether the external contract is malicious, again, you don't know. You just know that they wrote for a certain thing, but it may be that perfect attack surface that lets someone into your contract. Any contracts it calls can execute malicious code. Again, you may call another contract. That other contract may call another contract. You may actually go layers deep in this, right? Because you don't know where the origination point is, and that's why f contract flow is so very important. Now, when you get into that state change, the real danger is just that malicious code just starts hijacking your flow, right? And that will lead to vulnerabilities due to reentrancy. This issue is discussed more in detail. We talk about reentrancy all the way through this because it's a really common issue along the way. So whenever you're making a call to an untrusted external contract, avoid changing the state of the contract till after the call has ended. And again, that's that idea of come in, check to see if a condition has been met. If the condition is met, pay money. You want to make sure that you check that condition first before you pay money. And again, that affects interactions pattern is a really good thing to go check. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we get into that as well. Now, when they change things, they really do change things. So they really want you to stop using transfer and stand and start using call, right? So the interesting part, though, is that they talk about this because it's part of how a uh, contract function is charged in terms of gas. So when transfer and send are used, you're burning 2,300 gas. That's the common, oh, that's how much it's going to cost. 
Now that gas stipend was hard coded to prevent reentrancy vulnerabilities, but it assumes constant gas prices. And we know that for a fact that uh, it all goes up and it goes down, right? It goes up and down based on need. So they came up with this new EIP 1884 that was incorporated into the Instable charred fork. So now you get that increase in gas costs for the S-load operation, resulting in a contract's fallback function costing more than 2300 gas. Do so you really want to stop using transfer and send just to keep call? Just mostly just because of expenses. Now, EIP 1884 was really kind of interesting because what they've seen over time and they address this in EIP 150 as well, is that if you reprice these protocols, the cost actually goes down, right? So in EIP 150, they change the balance from 400 to 700, then to 2300. So they keep on moving that goalpost in an attempt to keep the usage down. So it's really more of an expenditure versus resource consumption process. And the focus was on S-load because if you go back through their documentation, it showed that this was the most ex second most expensive item. The other one was check bank balances, right? And you, we're not going to change that. Everyone wants to know what the bank balance is. So we want to verify that there are funds there. So repricing from what we've seen from past history is going to become a common practice and one to be really aware of as they change things around. So just be really aware of what those gas prices are when you start building at your contract. And it's probably not a bad idea to start adding up all the gas prices to see if your expenditure is what you want it to be in terms of resource consumption on the network. Now, they give a really good example in here and that that's what the highlighted green is, message sender dot call value amount rather than transfer or whatever, right? So we wanna make sure that we have all of those things and remember to check for that return value, right? We really wanna make sure what we've got. Now, this example does not mitigate a reentrancy attack. It's just a, an example of how to use call. The other thing that's interesting too, and I love this one, because error handling is huge, right? And honestly, you want to be able to handle errors. You want to be able to work with a lot of the processes that go in here because sometimes they go wrong. Uh, and partial, you have a partial wallet address. You have something happen on the network. Something drops off. Something happens on the other side of the contract. That fails, right? So there are ways of doing this for addresses, right? And that's address call, call code, delegate call, and address send. And these are all pretty low level methods that will return false when an exception occurs. So they don't throw an exception, but they do give you a return code that you can then do a try catch error on, right? So when you're using these low level methods, make sure that possibility that that call will fail by checking the return value and then making sure of what you've got. And again, it's pretty straightforward, especially when you come into contract calls, I would always do air handling just because it makes sense. It gives me an option and I can then go and do a trace or something else when that air happens that I can then work with to figure out what actually went wrong, right? Especially if it's something like a bad, a bad wallet address or something else. So they give you this really kind of Interesting example, Boolean success, you know, again, check for that value. And if not success, then I want you to handle this failure code. If it is successful, then I want you to go ahead and deposit 300. But check that value. Make sure that you get those values back. Kind of cool. And then pull rather than push. And you've probably heard a lot about pull over push. Now, pull is interesting because it fails minimizing damage of failure. And it's a good idea, especially if you're sending money to somebody, is have them pull it from you rather than you try to push it to some wallet or blacklist or something else that's going on. It is 100% better to let the user pull or withdraw money from the contract rather than try to send money to them, especially if it's a bad wallet address because there are no refunds. The other interesting thing about this too, it reduces issues when you hit gas limits. So pull is better than push. So always use pull when you get this thing going and you got your contract working. Now, when you're delegating a call, I want you to remember, make, remember, delegate, right? Make is another option to make sure you do not use delegate call on an unconstant contract, right? So remember that smart contracts run code. If you're gonna delegate an action, you want to make sure it's to your own contract or your own code that you're delegating the action to. You certainly do not want to delegate an action to some code that you are not intimately familiar with, 
right? You don't want to delegate an action at the DAO owner level to Joe Bob's check them out DAO shop. You really don't. So remember that when you're doing delegate action, you want to make sure that you're doing it to one of your own codes, one of your own program sets. You never want to delegate action to a user supplied address because again, people make boo-boos all the time. So you want to make sure that that delegate action is never to user supplied data. Never trust anything from a user because it's horrible. All right, so when you're making external calls, other contracts, these are a great way of atomizing functions. These are a great way of code reuse along the board, but you want to make sure you're doing this safely because people make mistakes, code is horrible, people do crazy things, right? You want to make sure you are absolutely 100% of the time using error handling. Absolutely, and that's a ingrained from Microsoft days kind of process. Never, ever, ever trust code that's not yours. Never, ever, ever, ever trust user input and then pull rather than push a value. And again, so these are just some common sense things when you're doing external calls that I really want you to be aware of and I want you to take advantage of why you've got them in your pocket. That's kind of it for this lecture on external calls and I will see you in the next one.